Okay, so people are joining us. Um, sorry for the slightly late start. We're having a blizzard, so perhaps that had something to do with it, but we survived, we're surviving. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm James Shaheen, Tricycle's editor and publisher. I'll be chatting with Sharon Salzberg today. Sharon is a world-renowned meditation teacher, best-selling author, and co-founder of the Insight Meditation Society in Barry, Massachusetts. I should also add that she's a very good friend and a great friend to Tricycle. Her most recent book is Real Change, Mindfulness to Heal Ourselves and the World. Sharon will be co-teaching a year-long online retreat called The Way of the Buddha, Core Teachings of the Dharma Path. We're posting registration link in the chat panel at the bottom of your screen. You can join for the entire year or choose individual months by topic. The retreat begins at seven this evening, Eastern Standard Time, but all sessions will be recorded, so time zone is not an issue. The retreat is being offered by the Insight Meditation Society. So Sharon will begin by leading us in a short meditation. And after that, I'll ask her a few questions. You can ask your own questions by posting in the Q&A panel at the bottom of the screen. So Sharon, do you want to lead us now? I would love to. And I, I want to um, thank uh, everyone at Tricycle for, for hosting this. And I, I think it's great for us to begin with a sitting. James and I just had a flurry of texts. I can't get in. Can you get in? It's getting really close. James was full of confidence. He said, they always work it out. I don't know how they do it. Is it snowing there? It's not snowing yet in Barry, but you know, we're expecting, you know, it's like, it, it was just extraordinary that we got on with like seconds to spare. So um, I don't know how many of you have had a similar experience, but whatever the situation is, we usually come to these experiences with some amount of energy. Uh, we have to make sure we have the time and do we get it right and all that. So let's um, just arrive more fully by doing some practice. Well, yeah, one quick question. Don, yeah. um, apparently there was a glitch in the link that was posted initially. It's a day full of glitches already, but um, my colleague, Donya Spencer will repost the link um, in the chat uh, at the bottom of the screen. So Sharon, sorry to interrupt. Okay, no, that's great. Um, I actually saw that in the chat. I didn't know what it meant, so <laughs> that was great. I actually do like to start virtually everything I do, uh, not just virtually, with just a short period of meditation because it is a way of kind of gathering one's perhaps fairly scattered energy and arriving more fully. So. Uh, we can just do a simple one, which is um, if you just sit comfortably, you can close your eyes or not. If your eyes are open, they could be like a little bit open. You could find a spot to rest your gaze. Let it go. We'll start just by listening to sound. Somebody said uh, in the chat that the snow has muffled all of the sounds here in Queens, New York. So you may be hearing quiet or the sound of my voice or other sounds. It's a way of relaxing deep inside, allowing our experience to come and go. It's like the sounds just wash through you. And bring your attention to the feeling of your body sitting, whatever sensations you discover. You can feel the earth supporting you. Feel space touching you. Usually we think about touching space and we think about like picking up our finger and poking it in the air, but space is already touching us. We just need to receive it. Bring your attention to your hands and see if you could make the shift from the more conceptual level, like go fingers, to the world of direct sensation which is also the world of constant change, picking up warmth, coolness, pressure, whatever it might be, 
You don't have to name these things, but feel them. And then bring your attention to the feeling of your breath, just the normal, natural breath, wherever you find it most distinctly, the nostrils or the chest or the abdomen. You can find that place, bring your attention there and just rest. See if you can feel one breath. And if images or sounds or sensations or emotions arise, just let them come and go as you breathe. You don't have to follow after them. You don't have to fight them. And if you find you're caught up in thought or you fall asleep or whatever, you're just gone. That's okay too. See if you can realize that, gently let go and just bring your attention back to the feeling of the breath. And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes or lift your gaze and we'll end the meditation. So thank you for that. Thank you, Sharon. It's always nice after a little drama <laughs> to sit still and it's no big deal. Um, you know, usually this time of year, I'd be up there sitting a uh, retreat and um, and I'm used to being up there sometimes on Valentine's Day. You're celebrating 46 years now. So 45. 45. Isn't it 75 or is it 76? Uh, we moved into Valentine's Day in 76. We, oh, we okay. incorporated okay. in 75 and found 45 is great. So congratulations yeah. to everybody at IMS. I just say that because we have to know when the 50th is, you know, <laughs> not be confused about that. I'll be there, I hope. Um, yeah, so you know we're all we're all living uh, in lockdown or semi-lockdown, depending where you are. And I found that doing online retreats has been a real help uh, through this time. And I was wondering, you know, when I saw that you were doing a one-year retreat, I thought, wow, one year. Of course, people can do pick specific months, but why don't you tell us something about that? Well, it's maybe more a program than a retreat. Um, in that um, we're also trying to uh, create something for people. I mean, either people are at home and perhaps isolated or they're working and um, not able to do kind of the normal social gathering or whatever. Uh, so like I read the chats when I'm teaching 
on Zoom and I see, you know, tremendous amount of kind of loneliness and um, depression and anxiety and and also a tremendous commitment to utilizing the tools of meditation uh, to try to stay connected in a deeper way to themselves and, and to one another. And so um, that was part of the impetus for offering a longer program. And I've, from the close to the beginning of my own meditation practice, have been fascinated by kind of the schema of um, the Buddha's worldview. And it, it is kind of a worldview. Um, it's not exactly a belief system at all, the way we normally use that term. Uh, my first teacher was S.N. Goenka, and I started, I just had a 50th anniversary of, of becoming a meditator. January 7th, 1971, I started, and which is totally like a dream. How did that happen? But um, I, um, the, he taught in the format of an intensive 10 day, like immersion retreat. And the first night of the retreat, so this is like really my beginning, you know, um, uh, Goenka said, the Buddha did not teach Buddhism. The Buddha taught a way of life. And so that was like a foundational understanding for me. So it's not exactly an ism in the way we might normally use that that phrase. It's not a doctrine you have to believe or um, you're left out or something like that. But it's a fascinating kind of worldview that creates a context for the practices that we actually do. And the Buddha said something um, very beautiful somewhere, like um, if you study as well as practice, if you kind of learn about the, these elements of this worldview, if you deliberate, you know, if you think, does that seem true to me? If you question, uh, if you have conversations about it, the um, path you are on will broaden tremendously. And and that makes sense to me. So for example, one of the numbers, I'm, I'm forever going to call this the numbers course, because I thought of it, and I always called it the numbers course. It's got a much more elegant name now, like the wave of the Buddha or something like that. But the numbers course um, was important to me because one of, let's say one of the um, numbers we explore are the seven factors of enlightenment, the seven qualities of mind that are actually developed in doing a meditation practice, like mindfulness, um, energy, tranquility, things like that. And that understanding allows us to not feel kind of an attachment to a particular method. You know, like my method is the way and, and your techniques are really so much inferior to that. But to understand that the purpose of a method is to cultivate these qualities. And it's like a means to an end. It's not the end in and of itself. And then we can assess, does it actually cultivate these qualities as as I practice? So it's, it's just like this broadening, this opening beyond like sectarianism and attachment to a particular way. So I just thought it was a, a beautiful thing to explore. Yeah, you know, I just want to say to the, our listeners, for those who don't know, um, it's done in the style of the numbered discourses. So we start with one dharma, we end, up, we we go on to two truths, we go on to three characteristics and three poisons and so forth. Uh, I saw that you guys got down to the ten perfections, and it's kind of like the 12, 12 days of Christmas, but it's twelve months of dharma. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. um, you know, one interesting thing is that I watched your preview. Uh, and you talked about, like, let's say somebody wanted to take one month. I, what I found interesting is that you're saying in one of the groups, say the seven factors of enlightenment or um, the 10 perfections, that you can find all of the path. Did I hear that right? Yeah. That I mean, right? I've, I've also been fascinated by, I didn't used to know the word, but the way that an element of the path is like a fractal. You know, it's a part that is actually representative of the whole. So you can find just a tremendous amount of understanding. Well, Joseph is actually starting it tonight with one Dharma. He has a book out, uh, 
for some years now called One Dharma, and Joseph's actually on retreat right now. We live in a, a duplex. He's next door on retreat. Um, so I only kind of catch sight of him now and then, but he pre-recorded this because I was so much wanting uh, to start with one Dharma. And, you know, to not get involved in, um, again, attachment to a particular point of view, but to understand uh, these elements, these instructions, these suggestions, these uh, even invitations to look a little differently at ourselves in the world um, are about something. It's not to be seen as something to hold on to in and of itself. It's about learning to let go. It's about our own innate goodness. It's about coming back to parts of ourselves that maybe have never been cultivated or, and so we're not flourishing. And um, so uh, we also have, I'm, I'm starting tonight with the program, but as you said, it's, it's recorded so people can tune in later, you know, if they decide they wanna to attend, you know, not today, but, um, I'm starting with a brief introduction, if we have power and I have internet, which is a little bit unknown right now, but hopefully that'll work. And then Joseph's talk is pre-recorded, so that can go out. It's not going out from here. Um, and, and I think that's uh, something that's evocative of the whole, that there's uh, the teaching about non-grasping, which is part of his elucidation of one dharma whatever the metaphysics, whatever the skillful means, they're pointing to the same thing that we do, which is let go of identification and attachment and see what emerges from that. So there's the whole of the Dharma right there. So you can actually just do tonight if you want. <laughs> yeah, I, I was looking at uh, a month for, I, I think that the four uh, immeasurables are in there. And so we do loving kindness and compassion, equanimity, sympathetic joy. That is so abundant, that, that teaching. It is so, uh, it touches on so much in the entire tradition. Um, you know, you and I are talking about, or we're going to do a podcast. We're going to ask people how they're managing uh, through the pandemic. And, and for me, these online teachings are one excellent way that I've been managing. But one of the things I had to get used to is the interruptions, the distractions, and so forth. It's not the same as the retreat container. Um, but, you know, I think once I let go of this idea that it had to be perfect, that it had to be the same as any retreat, um, I kind of, the distractions became a part of it. Oh, that's happening. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know how people are, have been responding to you um, with online teachings and so forth, but. Yeah, I mean, there's a tremendous response. There are a number of people who, um, for whatever reason in their lives were already in, you know, pre-pandemic were in a position where they could no longer attend retreats. They were taking care of an older parent or um, they had kids or some situation had changed in their lives. So people began writing saying, I could no longer come to retreats. I'm so grateful that there's this opportunity. I've also seen it is a, an extraordinary sense of community. Um, that actually does develop and and people don't feel so alone as we explore these things together um and it has always been the case that we need to incorporate distractions you know we we try to create as pristine an atmosphere as we can for people as protected as possible and so on but they're always if not external distractions, internal distractions. I should also say I'm accustomed to practicing in Asia and um, it tends to be noisy. There's construction going on right outside the building somehow, wherever you are. There are loudspeakers blasting, you know, in uh, Burma. Um, we would be doing walking meditation and then uh, we were sort of in the outskirts of Rangoon and um, pe people would just in general blast these loudspeakers and, and there would be like music playing and you realize that that's like an old Beach Boys song, but it's in Burmese. What is that? What are the words to that? Or, or uh, in Burma again, the 
food is all offered to you. You don't pay actually to be there, uh, even room and board, um, because everything is offered to you. And so that's a moment in time for people. Like that's how you celebrate, like your daughter graduated from high school. So you go to the monastery and you offer food for as many people as you can afford to pay for to eat or somebody in your family died and you want to honor them. So you you go to the monastery and you offer food. And so it's always an event, you know, the family, sometimes the whole village shows up in making this offering. And so they're there and they're videoing you eating and they're, they're so full of joy at the chance to support your practice in this way. And then sometimes there's a ceremony afterwards and you know, or once I remember sitting in Burma, minding my own business, like I'm sure probably on the verge of enlightenment, there's a knock at the door. And so I, you know, I, I stagger up and I open the door and, and there's somebody from the monastery saying, time for a group photo. So I kind of go out, you know, and, and then all the Westerners are gathered in front of the gate, you know, so there's Joseph and my Ram Dass and my friends and it was like, they were always, or even just surviving, you know, making sure the water has been boiled or, um, it's, it's a rich life. We don't have quite the complexity here because we do make that effort, but then there are internal distractions that just pop up, you know, like I've got a right to so-and-so <laughs> make sure that I tell them, you know, whatever. So we're always dealing with that. So it's a, it's a really enriching experience actually. Well, in month five, we'll learn about the five hindrances so it's a long time to wait i'm sorry but <laughs> it was five you know <laughs> like, yeah i mean i i'm glad that when i'm at ims nobody knocks on my door um although i have barged in on others when i went to the wrong room but <laughs> they've had to deal with me as a distraction too. i remember that <laughs> really well do you want to he tell that story <laughs> So I just want to remind our listeners that if you have a question, put it in the Q&A panel at the bottom of the screen. I see some people are putting, putting them in chat. We'll, we'll get to those also, but it's um, best and easiest if you put them in the Q&A panel. So Sharon, do you miss, do you miss that practice in Burma? Well, poor Burma. I mean, even as we speak, you know, it's having a, a military coup. It's like, um, I, I miss elements of it for sure it's like uh, regardless of the government system you know the people i mean here are all these westerners nobody's paying anything to be there and you're surviving on the incredible generosity of some very poor people who actually rejoice so deeply in the chance to to make that offering and um the degree of their their generosity their faith is is really a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. And um, there's something about also the, uh, you know, again, it's like the breadth of the, the Dharma or, or the understanding, you know, like you wake up in the morning and there are nuns chanting, you know, and they, this is what they're chanting, you know, the five spiritual faculties or the seven factors of enlightenment or the four Brahma Viharas where they're doing loving kindness chanting and um, you just feel surrounded in a very different kind of energy. And But the chance to practice that all anywhere, even at home, you know, is an extraordinary thing. And uh, one of the strange sort of uh, benefits for a person like me in this pandemic time is that, as you know, I'm, I'm really used to traveling all the time. and. So um, I'm not traveling at all. I rarely leave this room, actually. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's uh, not only the travel time, but the arranging time, like um, who's going to pick me up at the airport and where am I going to stay and all of that. So that's all found time. And I've realized that one of the things I can do with this time is actually work to be kinder. And, and this is, even in simple ways, like I've developed the habit of not just sending an email, but reading it before I press send and editing it. You know, not that I'm not mean usually, but 
you know, I, I just think, well, you know, that could be misunderstood, that sentence, or that could be distracting. Maybe I don't need to put that in, or why am I saying this, you know? Like, they don't need to know this. It'll just, you know, uh, not be that good or, or whatever. And I, I've, I'm just saying, okay, my goal is greater kindness, and I'm just going to use the time that is now available to me to actualize it. You know, often you teach... Um about bringing uh, our practice into our everyday lives, particularly uh, loving kindness, for instance, on a subway platform. Um, my world has so shrunk, and today with the blizzard, it's especially small. Um, uh, I wonder sometimes if just puttering around uh, my apartment, uh, how I might uh, pay closer attention. And I, and I think of the teaching, and so I touch the faucet, and I try to feel what that faucet feels like it's cold the other one is warm and so forth um it, it, the world is much smaller but there are infinite things to notice yeah no true and um one of the things about um whatever it's called the, the way of the buddha <laughs> the numbers course the way of the buddha. <laughs> um is that uh it, first of all it would be taught by many many different teachers you know like um, there's a community of teachers at IMS. There's an entire community of uh, next generation teachers um, who are uh, have been through an IMS teacher training program. Um, and what I asked, uh, which I liked a lot as a feature, was I asked people to think about what topic they were most passionate about, whether it's the loving kindness or. Uh, the four foundations of mindfulness or some of the parami, paramitas, the perfections. And so people will um, be talking about the thing that means something to them in terms of the teachings. And we find things, obviously, qualities repeating, like mindfulness will appear in many of these lists. It's not just one and done, you know. And so we will hear different angles on mindfulness from different people, because what you just described is is a particular um, extension of practice into daily life, which is very, very important, and it's part of mindfulness, whether it's mindfulness of the body, like feeling the sensation as you turn the, the faucet, which is a wonderful grounding way of actually being with our experience. It tends to be um, the easiest to access, you know, you can feel your feet against the ground, even if you're in the middle of an uproar, you know, going on around you. Um, or we may be practicing mindfulness of uh, feeling tone, you know, which is the pleasantness, unpleasantness, or neutrality of what's happening in the moment. You realize you're uncomfortable with something you're hearing or seeing, or uh, you just get that, that sort of sensibility about that. Um, it, there's so many aspects to, to mindfulness and so many ways of living it in our daily life and, and people will be addressing from their own angle, their own experience, many of them. Okay, Sharon, you keep calling it the numbers course. In case people have joined us late, it's called The Way of the Buddha, Court Teachings of the Dharma Path. And uh, we're posting a link to the registration page in the chat at the bottom of your screen. Um, so we can start taking questions from all of you. And Sharon, I'll begin with uh, Jesse, who asks, how do you suggest approaching the embarrassment of riches in terms of online Dharma, Dharma offerings these days? It's exhilarating, but also overwhelming. As Tara Brock says, it risks us getting into a trance of unworthiness that we will only find enlightenment after just one more course, one more book. Um. As, as with anything, I mean, I'm, you know, quite grateful for the abundance of riches. You've also saved yourself a trip to Burma, <laughs> and India, you know, and schlepping around the world and getting sick and all of that. Um, and, and I think, you know, different things are uh, enticing or meaningful at different times. You, you don't need to do it all. Remember the fractal, you know, it's like a, a kind of... Um, uh, dedication, you know, to any one thing will have the possibility of 
of bringing you not only depth but breadth in the end. Um, I think that uh, it's an interesting exercise to see how we're spending our time and what we used to do, like me, since I used to arrange travel, you know, so much of my time. I'm not doing it anymore, and so what am I going to do with that time? Um, and then just to see what what you want to do, like um, <clears throat> I'm uh, also the kind of person where I need something to be available in a recording because I'm really busy, as it turns out, and I can't necessarily make that hour, you know, on that day, and uh, so there's a certain practicality to that. And I'm also, um, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic. I thought, I'm going to learn Spanish, which I did not do. Uh, you know, of course, I also thought it was going to be a month, but um, it, it turned out to be quite a bit longer. But um, I, in the end, I had to prioritize, you know, what am I going to do? Um, and I, I sign up for programs, you know, as a student, um, both because it... it uh, helped me, you know, to see things from another angle or to keep learning, because I appreciate that sense of community, even though, you know, I may not be joining in an ordinary way. I'll answer a question really quickly. Someone asked if it's okay to sign up for selected months. The answer to that is yes, you'll see that option uh, on the registration page. Um, Jerome asks, the type of sensation practice that you and Joseph teach is based on noting. The type of sensation practice that Goenka teaches is based on scanning. Can you please clarify the benefits and deficiencies of each of these two types of insight meditation? Um, I think the answer to that is really based on personal experience, you know, and um, Goenka was my first teacher, as I said, and uh, he, he taught uh, what we these days call a body scan made popular through John Kabat-Zinn's work in mindfulness-based stress reduction, although going, a body scan is where you move your attention in a patterned way throughout your body. Uh, Goenka started with the top of your head, which is why I made that gesture. John starts with your feet, you know. Uh, I don't know why. And um, I know John's original students, uh, because I was there as an observer, were often very ill. They were lying down. Um, they were referred. He was in the um, UMass Medical Center um, in Worcester, which is very close to Barry, and uh, they were referred by their physicians, um, often because there was nothing else the physicians felt they could do in the course of a particular illness. You know, twenty-five year history of migraines or whatever, um, and that stress might be playing a, a role. So. It was very experimental. And uh, so then I thought, well, maybe you start with your feet because people were lying down. I don't know. Um, uh, it's really um, good in a lot of ways for a lot of people to have that movement of attention. It picks up energy, you know, it gets so sluggish, you know, and kind of tranquil out. Um, and it can open up, uh, you know, tremendous awareness of the body. I was recently reading uh, some view, not all research confirms this, but some does, that that sense of interoception, that internal awareness of sensation uh, is an important gateway for empathy. Because with empathy, we actually resonate with a felt sense of what someone is likely going through, and we feel that through that sensitivity. So if you have no sensitivity in that way, it's just going to be harder, or you need a different gateway to have empathy. So the, I think there's a lot of benefit from that. The, the noting, um, in some ways, uh, which is placing a mental label on the predominant experience you're having, if the word comes easily. So with the breath, you might be noting in, out with, and maybe as you're noting in, out, this big wave of anger arises, then you're noting anger, anger, or joy, joy, or something like that. So actually placing the mental label serves some of the same function as moving your attention. 
if you're just with the breath, it can be a little bit like a lullaby after a while. But if you're saying in out with it, it'll pick up your energy. So you're in a different state of balance. And um, I don't think there's an absolute um, uh, kind of superiority to or hierarchy, you know, to, to techniques. It depends on where you're at, what's working for you. I once heard the Dalai Lama say that somebody was giving a lecture, I mean, it was a meeting and someone else was speaking and uh, they were talking about kind of the superiority of the particular path they offered and the Dalai Lama actually interrupted them and said, uh, the way that's best is the way that works for you. And I think that's an important consideration. And also it may not be forever you know it may be that um like i practiced uh various forms of mindfulness you know body scan and mental noting for 14 years before i did this immersive three-month retreat in loving kindness so that became part of what i was experimenting with as well and it was you know such a huge benefit to me that I, i began teaching it right away and so um you know, it's just, I mean, the same debate goes on all the time. Um, and that's part of why I've really appreciated something like, um, I'll try to be good, the way of the Buddha, that some sense of appreciation for the context, for the worldview, for the tenets that are underlying the practice, because it's not just a question of, like, I've heard tremendous debate about should you pay attention to your breath at the nostrils or should you pay attention to your breath at the abdomen? And Which is not the most scintillating of conversations, you know, and you think, who cares, really? But people do care if they're holding on to a particular um, point of view. And, and that's, again, it's why study broadens our perspective. It's like, what does awareness of the breath do? How does it function? Why do we use it? as an object of awareness. What if you can't use the breath? You know, what alternatives are there? Does it really make a difference? And it might for some people between being aware of the nostril and being aware of the abdomen. Um, And so what do you look for as a kind of criteria, whether it's a a skillful tool for you? Okay, thank you. Um, Lisa asks, Working from home as a psychologist, I am at times overwhelmed by the magnitude of suffering, loss, death. I have been profoundly reminded of the impermanence of this earthly life. How do I better care for myself as a caregiver? That's something you've talked a lot about. Um, Yeah, that's a huge question, and it's it's very important. I think um, uh, some of the science that's interesting... um, these days is making a distinction between empathy and compassion. Empathy being that like felt sense, that resonance, especially if somebody seems to be suffering. And compassion is one possible response to that, you know? So empathy is essential. It's like an essential but not sufficient building block for compassion to arise. So I'm defining compassion um, as a movement of the heart. It's like a movement toward to see if we can be of help. And it needs that sense of empathy to begin with, but empathy is not enough because I see it really in sequential terms. We might feel, you know, into someone's situation and and we have that resonance, but then we're frightened by it, you know, and we just want to turn away or we're exhausted, we're depleted. We feel we've got no inner resource with which to meet it, and so we we just can't take it in. Or um, we get blaming. I met a therapist some years ago uh, who told me he, he had just gotten into this loop of blaming his clients, like they would tell him a story, and he'd think, I told you what to do six months ago. If you'd only listen, you wouldn't be in this bad way. Or we might have that weird kind of savior Mentality, which is really common, like I'm responsible for fixing everything. Or we might have the compassionate response, which is moving toward, not into, 
right, to burn up ourselves to see if we can be of help, not insisting that we are in control and we're going to fix it all. So that implies boundaries. It implies balance, like maybe it's compassion for ourselves as well as for others. Um, it involves wisdom. There are limits, you know, like sometimes we act, many times we act and we're just planting a seed. We're not going to get instant gratification and see, you know, an immediate result. And uh, so first I would, and I, you know, I work so much with caregivers um, and I have huge respect uh, for anyone in that role, whether in their personal life or their professional life. And I see, you know, there's so much um, uh, emphasis on empathy training these days, which is crucial. It's like we also see a world that's pretty cold and cruel without enough empathy. But I think my people, they have plenty of empathy. You know, they're burning out for some other reason. And and so it's exploring what does compassion mean and what are those boundaries and what would it look like to also have compassion for myself, which is not selfish or self-preoccupied. It's necessary. Um, and then you almost like make up your own resilience plan. You know, sometimes it's remembering things that you used to do. And I know it's hard now because so much of our activity is constrained, but you know, I've done workshops in the past with people in caregiving roles, and we ask them in one column to write down, like, what lifts your spirits? What gives you perspective? What brings you balance? And then to write in another column, like, look back at what you just wrote and see if you have a comment about it. And literally, this happened, and it happened once in this literal way, but there, there are echoes of that everywhere. Somebody had written down, I get out in nature. And then they wrote down, well, I haven't done it in about seven years. You know, and you think, well, maybe pick it up again, you know. So, I mean, even given the constraints of our situation, uh, maybe there are things that we have done that we're not doing or things we want to learn, like the tools of meditation. Okay, so Benjamin asks, I love seeing new dialogue. I've, I've loved seeing new dialogues opening between different spiritual and religious traditions. What is something from another faith that has inspired you? And what traditions are you eager to explore further? Uh, partly, um, you know, I, I am far from a scholar of Buddhism. And, and uh, when I said I wanted to learn Spanish, you know, I had spent years trying to learn Pali, which is the language of the original Buddhist text. And I think that wouldn't be a bad thing either. Uh, and there's so many lineages and schools and uh, variations in within Buddhism that um, I think I, I would benefit and, and hopefully bring benefit to others from just exploring some of those, you know, uh, as well. I was raised Jewish, and so that's in me. Um, and, and there are various elements of that that are inspiring to me, you know, in, in terms of daily life especially and um, social justice and uh, things like that. And... Um, I spent some of the most significant years of my life in India, so that, you know, that meant uh, Hinduism, you know, all around me, and uh, to some extent Islam, um, but mostly in, in terms of where I was, it was Hinduism, and, and so any of that, you know, was very uh, important for me in and developing just as, I mean, I went to India when I was 18, you know, so just developing as a human being, as a person, um, was was really important. So I've been to, you know, I've been to Buddhist Christian conferences, I've been to Jewish Buddhist conferences, and some of the most interesting ended up being Buddhist Buddhist conferences because it's all different. Like I had, uh, I had breakfast with a rabbi once, um, we were at some conference together, and I asked him a question about Judaism, and he said, which Judaism? 
you know, and you could easily say say the same thing about Buddhism. So I'll probably spend the rest of my life just trying to study that. Okay, um, I have a few questions here about the course itself. I'll read them both together. And just to remind everybody, if you click through the registration page, you'll see a pretty uh, complete description of the course, but here goes. Uh, Nancy asks, hi Nancy, uh, who are the moderators of the course? Uh, Sharon, along with who else? And also, what is the format of the course and how often and how long are the talks offered? Is there interactive or experiential work, assignments? So that, that's all the answer for you at the registration page, but Sharon, go ahead. Yeah, I don't know that there are moderators per se, you know, like um, uh, I know I'm doing uh, some number of the evenings and uh, the class is an hour and a half. Uh, my classes are an hour and a half. Um, which will include, uh, like I'm starting um, with two, you know, which is the two truths. It's like relative and absolute truth. So um, relative truth being um, the world as we perceive it, you know, and truth like cause and effect and the power of loving kindness and things like that. Absolute truth being things like emptiness, um, in substantiality and uh, the way these two truths relate to one another or um, one way of saying it is the relative truth we might look at a tree and see a tree and with a more absolute perspective we look at a tree and we also sense the soil which is nourishing it and everything that affects the quality of that soil which includes the rain and everything that affects the quality of the rain so we look at a tree and we see a network of interconnection of relationship that's also true. And one doesn't deny the other, but they actually inform one another. So um, that first class uh, will be the two truths. Um, I'll speak, there are texts that have already been uh, recommended, you know, I mean, short things, not like big laborious things, but um, to read about that, I'll speak, we'll sit, and then there's questions. Um, so, uh, and I think there are some evenings, um, I'd have to pull up the actual schedule, which I don't have in front of me, which are just questions and answers. So um, I'm doing uh, the two truths. I'm doing um, one of the threes. I'm doing the personality types because I'm fond of telling stories about being a deluded type. And it'll be the same format. Then I'm doing some stuff later. Okay, if you hear some rumbling in the background, the snow plows are making lots of noise. Um, somebody writes, uh, having depression, I find it hard to do some stuff that I need to do and I know how, like nutrition, exercise, paperwork, meditation, but the depression is sometimes debilitating. How to overcome? Um, I think in terms of meditation, uh, it really helps to have a teacher or a guide because one of the states we tend to get into is a kind of rigidity, like it's got to look a certain way, it's got to be a certain length, it has to be a certain form. And uh, it's hard to remember that our goal ultimately is not like a particular state of bliss or even peace, but it's balance. And balance will always look different. You know, for some people, um, we have no energy at a certain time. And so balance might mean not practicing in a way that expends more. It might mean practicing in a way that picks it up. It might mean uh, practicing for five minutes, not for 45 minutes. Um, and that doesn't mean it's, um, you know, defective or you're defective or um, it's not like you need remedial work. That is the work. It's it's all about balance. And so, um, you know, we get into, and I've gotten into as a student, the idea that it's got to be 45 minutes, got to be with your eyes closed. It has to be in a certain form. Um, but the reality is that for some people at certain times, not forever, but at times, Maybe a short walk is much better, being mindful, or maybe loving kindness, uh, eyes open, is going to be much better. And I mean, 
one example would be somebody who came here. Um, I'm in Barry right now, so came to the retreat center when it was open. Um, after a, you know, tremendously, immediately after a tremendously traumatic experience, and and um, the thing that was, which is not really recommended, but it was a done deal, you know. Uh, and the thing that was most helpful was really like feel the glass, you know, feel the coldness of it, feel the weight of it, you know, feel the experience of drinking from it. Um, and, and that was, uh, you know, very different kind of practice than one might think is perfect, uh, but it was perfect. Okay, I think I can ask the next one. Sharon may want to add something. Is the new course more expansive than Sharon's tricycle course, The Whole Path? Well, yes, it's going to cover far more ground and far more, far uh, much more material. But Sharon, you might want to say something quickly before we. Yeah, and I think you know, depending on. Um, I I love the the numbers, you know, and I always have, and the story behind that, you know, as I said. Um, introducing it for IMS was that uh, the actual teachings of the Buddha were an oral tradition for some hundreds of years um, after the time of the Buddha. And for some people that makes them kind of suspect, you know, like they're not authentic. And I have heard anthropologists say that an oral tradition is actually tends to be more authentic in a lot of times because um, people invest in memorizing and learning because they know it's their responsibility to pass it on or else it's going to die. And I think about myself in this day and age, and I think that's really true. It's like, you know, I Google something and I even have the conscious thought, I don't have to bother remembering it because I can always Google it again tomorrow, you know? Um but here were, you know, a few centuries of people who did feel that responsibility. And in order to better memorize things, they created that system, you know, the three of these and the four of those and the five of those and the seven of those and the eight of those and, and so on. And um, it worked, you know, which is really interesting. And so uh, I think it's it's really fascinated me to see say mindfulness in this context and then mindfulness in that context and, and, and what's the difference and to see what's repeated and to see um, different angles on things, you know? So uh, I think it's, it's a kind of exciting exploration all in and of itself. Okay, I see several more questions about the course. Again, you can go to the registration page and we will once again post um, the link to that page in the chat, which will answer all of your questions, um, but we have time for one more question and I'll finish with this. Uh, and after that, Sharon, if you don't mind taking us out with this brief meditation. Sure, let me just answer something that came into the chat, which is about something else, Okay. Uh, which is about the uh, real happiness challenge, which we're also, I'm doing in February, it's not anything to do with IMS, where, um, Every February for the last 11 years, we've done uh, this challenge based on my book, Real Happiness, The Power of Meditation, a 28-day program. That's why we, it's every February. And uh, registration closed today. Someone wrote that they still want to get in. But the best thing to do is send me an email. You can send it to Sharon at SharonSalzberg.com, and I will forward your email. I'm not going to be able to copy it over from the chat. I'll forward your email to the people who now have to enter people mechanically instead of having it work. So, uh, but uh, you know, I'll tell them to put you in. Okay. You're muted, James. My colleague, Danya Spencer adds, we'll send an email with some additional course information to all attendees here, which should answer some questions about timing and format. So one last question before Sharon leads us in a short meditation. What teachings or practices are most exciting, Sharon, are most exciting to you at the moment? Uh, any recent revelations regarding your practice? 
Um, I, uh, it's, it's a little bit twofold. Somebody's asking my email at Sharon at Sharon Salzburg.com. You just have to be sure spell check doesn't change Salzburg to have a U in it has an E in it. Um, it likes to think it's the same as the city, but it's not. Um, the first practice I ever learned was feeling the breath at the nostrils with Goenka. And I find myself going back to that a fair amount. And the quality that I am appreciating a lot about that is the sense of rest. You know, there's so much going on and it's so tumultuous and, and just those moments of like, okay, I'm just gonna rest. Um, in my early practice, as I often say, it was difficult for me to be with this breath in part because almost as soon as this was happening, I was kind of mentally leaning forward to get ready for the next 50. And um, for me, balance looked like settle back, let the breath come to you. And I realized I'm kind of back there, you know, uh, and that it's still, it's so helpful to just like settle back, let the breath come to you. Or when I use that example of space, space is already touching us. Because uh, those moments of respite are so crucial right now. And and they're really, um, you know, they can seem selfish or lazy or whatever, but they're very, they're really very important. Uh, and then loving kindness meditation, you know, which kind of became my thing since I had gone to Burma in 85. I was uh, teaching it, you know, later in, I'd already been teaching for years, but not that. And I don't know that anybody was really in this tradition. And, and I came back and started teaching it. And then my first book was called Loving Kindness. So it's sort of my thing. Um, and it's challenging, of course, you know, like, uh, one of the things that happened when I was um, looking at uh, writing a preface for my last book, Real Change, was that I asked myself, well, what's still true in the midst of all this craziness and, you know, loss and, and sorrow and anxiety and what's still true? And I thought of the Buddha's statement, um, hatred will never cease by hatred. Hatred will only cease by love. This is an eternal law. And I thought, well, that's a weird thing for the Buddha to say, like, this is an eternal law. It's like Mr. Impermanence. So every once in a while, you know, something outrageous happens and I think it's still true, <laughs> you know, like that's still true. And I really do believe it's still true. And so that's a big part of my practice. Well, that's a nice way to end. Just a reminder to everybody, the course is uh, the way of the Buddha core teachings of the Dharma path. And again, the link is in the chat. Um, Sharon, thank you so much. It's always great to see you. It's always great to chat with you. Um, do you want to take us out with a short meditation? Yes. Why don't we do just a few minutes of loving kindness meditation? Um, where instead of resting our attention on the feeling of the breath, we'll rest our attention on the silent repetition of certain phrases which are an offering, you know, like gift giving. And the first recipient is ourselves. So common phrases would be, may I be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. May I be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. You can use these phrases or any three or four phrases. Just gather all of your attention behind one phrase at a time. You don't have to try to force a feeling or manufacture anything. And if your attention wanders, it's really the same skill set. See if you can let go gently of the distraction and simply come back, in this case, to the phrases.
and see if you can call to mind someone who's been inspiring for you or helpful to you. It could be an adult, it could be a child, it could be a pet. The texts say, this is the one who makes you smile when you think about them. So if there's someone who makes you smile, bring them here. You can get an image of them or say their name to yourself. Get a feeling for their presence and offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. And then we'll just close with all beings everywhere, people, creatures, all those in existence. May all beings be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. So thank you. Thank you, Sharon. And thank you to all of those who joined us today. Um, stay safe. <laughs>